masses. Yeah, I have two now. Very important. Yeah, so you see that it's hard to be conscious, conscious of something when you're conscious as something. Yeah. When you're conscious as something, it causes you to be unconscious of the verb that you are, which is conscious of. That's what we are. If you really looked at yourself, not from the view of being a noun, you couldn't look at yourself, but the, the view that you're a noun, that you're a long-lasting, independent, separate entity, and this stability, there's actions issuing forth and actions hitting the shore of this. Yeah? And so there's reactions to actions happening seemingly to you, and then there are actions and consequences happening seemingly from you. So you become a noun that is involved in doing all the verbs or having, to be, having it being done to by the verbs. But that's where you look at life as life is happening to me. Yeah. It was a lie. Well, yeah. It not was a lie, it is a lie. Yeah. Because it's a verb. If it was a lie, it would be over. But it is a lie. That's the dilemma. See, if it was a lie, you would probably be aware of a state after it was a lie, which is it's not a lie anymore. But it's, it is a lie. It's lying. Yeah, so the head is lying all day at this moment because it's identified with what it's not, which is causing its ability to be conscious. It's not its ability. The ability to be conscious to be unconscious. You're unconscious to that ability. So... We're being presented and represented a very small picture in a very small window called self-centeredness. Yeah? And so our consciousness, which can be conscious of quite a lot and actually conscious of nothing, is being defined by a very small window that it can see through and be conscious of what's appearing. And what's appearing is always a you doing and having things. Either a you out there doing and having things, or a you doing and having things. Yeah? So the same movie is being run all the time. You're the noun that is precipitating the verbs. You're the noun that is being affected by the verbs. Yeah? So you become the most relevant, relevant point. Because let's say if it's going to be based you knowing the truth, let's say. And you can't do that because we are the truth. The truth is all there is is consciousness in my view. And we are that. But here, let's say we believe there's a truth. And not knowing that, the prior truth to that is we are a long-lasting independent separate entity, which is false evidence that's appearing real to you. So we're taking a falsehood to be the truth, and now this falsehood is going to search for the truth to get an advantage from it, hopefully. Yeah? It's hoping that, just like when I did drugs, I wanted to get an advantage. No, 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 wait, hold on, all right, so I can get it going. We're going to cook a little souffle here, but if you keep sticking your finger in it, it'll, it'll, it'll be in the oven all night. So. so here we're doing it. Yes? So there's a sense of being the noun that's doing and having. So then the truth becomes an object to you, and you go, hey, I want to know the truth. So now you do what you need to do, or what you think you need to know, know the truth. You don't realize the way you know the truth will never know the truth here. It will. It may know how to fix a car here. It may know how to make friends here, but it will never know the truth because you are the truth. Yeah? That you can't, this apparatus can't apply a methodology to know the truth because in that activity, that's the truth. Yeah? The truth is now experiencing not knowing itself and now looking for itself. It's hilarious in a way. Yeah? So what we're saying here is, once the truth becomes an object to you as a subject, you've lost the whole deal because now it's going to be based on what you do and have to you know, experience it. And also, your non-experience of the truth will be based on what you don't do and don't have. So which is really the most relevant aspect in your life, the truth or you? I would say you are because the truth will only be known or not known based on you. So you actually become the most supreme truth that can entertain truth or not. See, that to me is playing God, and that's what selfing does. The mental process plays God. Can you hold it? And maybe I'll, you'll forget the question afterwards. That would be good. <laughs> so 
this selfing yes, is playing God about the topic called God. Literally, because I bet you today you didn't feel you sensed God today. And then if there was that statement or that sense that you didn't feel God, then it usually was based on who? That you weren't feeling God. You or God? Was God hiding out or you were, or, or were you not looking? I would imagine it was you not looking. Yeah? <laughs> That's playing God. God is God now becomes a, a like a board game you can play as God. So and maybe you believe you're closer to God if you're at an evangelical meeting and everyone's yelling and screaming and doing speaking in tongues. Other people would not think that. They more think of it as being in a cave sitting quietly meditating. But in a sense, what's playing God is the selfing, yeah. The self, just like when people see, they think they see a vision. Usually people who are into Christianity see what they think is an image of Jesus. People who are in Buddhism see an image of Buddha. People who are in Islam see an uh, image of Muhammad. Why is that? <laughs> it's not Muhammad and Jesus and Buddha appearing to them. It's their conditioning making the appearance. They're conditioned to be a Christian, they see Jesus. If they're conditioned to be a Buddhist, they see Buddha. If they're conditioned to be Islamic, they see <clears throat> Muhammad. It's interesting, isn't it? How it matches so perfectly. Whatever you seem to be believing in, that's the image your God takes when it appears to you. <laughs> I would say you recognize what's playing God. <laughs> yeah. So I don't recognize unless it comes or appears to me in the way I can see him. Now, if God was overpowering, I would think he could overpower your little point of view. Don't you think? So if your little point of view is I can't recognize it unless I see it the way I want to see it, and that seems to hold truth to you or hold water, then you must be more powerful than God. I mean, I would think that God could overpower your distorted way of looking to sort of blow it out the water and just appear, ha ha, God. But if that happened, you would quickly box it up and change it and interpret it to neuter it. Because it will not stand for another God before it. And you know, even in the God of your own understanding, what does it do for you? Get your parking spaces, maybe. Maybe you'll get you a date, you know. Maybe you won't flip out at the next barbecue. Stuff like that. But, I mean, to have God working in our lives, supposedly, based on our framing of it, is limiting the possibility of that God's influence on you. Incredibly. I mean, our way of viewing things is so small and so constructed and so limiting. To apply that frame to let that much of God in your life is insanity to me. I would much rather entertain a God of its own understanding instead of my understanding. Because my understanding is going to cripple the God, the verb of Godding in my life. If, I don't call it God, but let's use that word. Yeah. It's going to cripple it. It's going to disable it, and it's going to make me superior to it. Always. I say this, I don't know if this has been your experience or not, but let's say if you have ever been a spiritual seeker, you may have found one person, one teacher that meant everything to you. Yeah? That you had the most utter conviction they had what you don't think you have, <laughs> or whatever. And so they would be the supreme authority to you, let's say in this life, more so than you would, you would expect even you. But then you, they meet, you meet them and they tell you, you know what, you're totally okay as you were, as you are, and as you will be. And maybe for 20 minutes, hearing that from this great authority, you would feel an incredible sense of relief. But I bet you it wouldn't last for long. You would go home and start playing God again. And you would neuter the message from all your godliness of that person you've been chiming about and yapping about and yapping about. Yeah, It would probably be, be dismissed in about three hours, four hours. You'd still start practicing what you needed to, you thought you needed to do to be okay and stuff like that. Yeah. What is that but God? What is that but playing God? 
to have you, and I mean to, I truly believe you are the final authority, but not the authority up here. This is the mental process playing God. Yeah. It's totally different when you get it in your gut than when you think you have it in your head. Because when, it, when you have it in your head, it's all the way you think it should be. It's all conceptualized to fit very well in your worldview, which is from self-centeredness. That's, you have that ability to be intuitive, for sure. But it's hard to be intuitive when you're depending on or relying on this system of self-centeredness because it's always rehashing and representing. It's not an intuitive system. It's a memory system. It's just representing and rehashing and rethinking and refeeling. It's not intuitive at all. When something occurs now, it applies a past uh, picture on it says, oh, this reminds me of that. And then that elicits or solicits a feeling and a thought stream based on that old memory. So you're just like an old, you're not even a CD player. You're like a 33 and a third album player. Mm -hmm. You're playing the same freaking tune. And it's the, things happen, the years go by, but the needle goes in the same groove. So it's the same old, same old. You're just representing it and rehashing it. Yeah, based in this small system. We're not, we're, what we're saying is, you don't have to do anything about that. Just realize you're not the center of it. If you're not the center of self-centeredness, if you're not that center, if you are not a long-lasting independent separate entity, then you start living an immunity to the effects of self-centeredness. It's that simple. But you can't get an immunity to the effects of self-centeredness, at least from my experience, as a self because that's the center of the system. What gives all the thoughts that are self-centered seems seemingly so new and novel is not the thoughts. They're actually quite archaic. You've been having them for years. You've been seeing them for years and years and years. But you dress them up by how you see them. You see them from self, from selfing, so they seem to be very new and important. I'm telling you, if you did a journal of your 10 years ago, it would be the same thoughts you're having now. You'd be worried about the same freaking thing. You'd be concerned about this. It hasn't changed one bit. You change the names and the geography and the props, but it's the same, same, same play over and over again, representing it from a different position. If I wouldn't have done that, if they hadn't have done that, if I would have been there, if I didn't get hit by the car, if I would have got that job, then everything would have been really rosy and great. That's the hope, yeah? But you can't pr produce what's not happening now. You can only entertain it. You can't produce it. Where is it? Where's next Friday? Can you feel it now? Can you see it? Can you taste it? Can you touch it? The event that's worrying you about next Friday, can you actually feel it right now? No. You, all you can feel is your mind's interpretation of what it thinks it's going to be like. You go into a mental realm. When you open up these packages of thoughts, which have all your old ideas in them, and they pop out like Christmas in the Christmas, you open up and there's your present, which is not present at all, it's all in time and what's not happening, then you get involved in it, you get interested in it, because why? It's about you, of course you're interested in it, and that interest grabs your attention, and what occurs is that mental experience creates or makes a physiological effect in your body. You start worrying as if that threat next Friday is happening now. This is the way it goes. And then, so what do you do? You feel fear, or let's say anxiety now. You look for a solution. Yeah, obviously. Maybe you have a drink, or you put on the TV, or you call up someone and say, Oh, I'm feeling terrible. And they go, Why? Well, next Friday, you know, whatever. And, uh, and then they go, Oh, yeah, I'm really worried about next Tuesday. And then you commiserate and you share your little what's not happening. And then you have a, a big party. Yeah? And the mental process can act like God because it makes a feeling up in you. You get nervous. You get worried. You get anxious. You start sweating. You make a lot of phone calls. Yeah? You start having resentments because you think they're out to get you. And all this stuff, all this false evidence appears real to you. Now, if you run it by someone else, it may not appear real to them. But it appears as real as real can be to you. But it doesn't appear real to someone you share it with, because it's what? It's false evidence. You have to believe it to make it seem like it's real. Yeah? So here's, the, and that's the, what they call an acronym of fear. False evidence is appearing real. 
So where does that false evidence occur, or what is it about? It's about what's not happening here. So you have this evidence being presented, I'm going to have cancer next week, I know it. I know my girlfriend, sleep. when I go away this week, she's going to be sleeping with somebody. I know it, I can tell. I've got surveillance cameras, I'm watching, i got my little spies, but I'm... So all this stuff is entertaining. And then there's a download, yeah, in this field of experience called the body, and your nerves get jangled, you start sweating, your stomach digestion goes bad, yeah? You never really hear now because you're just trying to rush to next Friday to try to control it and make something happen. So every moment that appears is not that important to you because you're really worried about this impending moment that's going to appear in next Friday. That, to me, is the ultimate of playing God. You're basically saying no to it. Even if it's not so, it is what is appearing now. You're saying blatantly no to that. And you're saying yes to what's not happening. And now let's say you come to me and you say, hey, I want to talk about what's not happening. If I was really going to serve you, the only thing I could say is, you know the solution to what's not happening is? Is that it's a recognition it's not happening. But, no, 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 really, the only solution that's worth its salt is that it's not happening. Not to therapize it, yeah? not to go over it with someone, over and over again, keep reproducing what's not happening into what's happening so it can seem like it's going to be happening. There's just a simple recognition, it's not happening. What more do you need to do after that? As soon as it's recognized that it's not happening, what occurs? There's immediate realization of what's happening. It's instantaneous. You realize that's not happening, and you come, you don't actually travel anywhere, because you never left anywhere, but you come to your senses, so to speak, and now you're rooted back into what's, not hap what's happening. And then the false evidence is appearing to be false. And you have immunity. So when, when you go up to that travel agent, and you buy the ticket to what's not happening, and there's no airport in what's not happening. There's no, like, five-star hotels in what's not happening. You're not going to get a massage in what's not happening. There's no beachfront in what's not happening. It's not happening. <laughs> it's not happening, is it? As soon as I see it's not happening, now I am conscious of what? I'm conscious of false evidence appearing to be false evidence. My consciousness does not get affected at all. It stays conscious because now it's conscious of what? What's happening? It's not unconscious to what's happening by being hyper-conscious of what's not happening, which is a mental experience. Obviously, it's not a physical one. Its effects are physical, but you cannot go to what's not happening. You really can't. No matter how much you're thinking about next Friday, if you look at the surveillance cameras of this night, and they have the date and the time, your body is here. No matter how much you're thinking about a year ago, your body is right here, now. You cannot go to what's not happening. It doesn't exist. You can only have a mental experience of it. Yeah? Only the mind can feel as if it's in what's not happening. And for it to have a real feeling of, of being in what's not happening, it has to become unconscious to what's happening. Because it couldn't enjoy the reality of what's not happening if there was a persistent, stubborn, irritating reality of what's happening. Yeah? The what's happening would keep you from really taking what's not happening seriously. It's the antidote. So it has to sort of forget what's happening and become totally overridden to what's not happening. Have you ever had it happen with you when you're driving? You may be driving and then you start thinking about something that's not happening and you, you seem like you're blacked out. You're still on Highway 101, but you're not at all conscious of it. You've totally left what's happening, but you haven't actually. But it seems like you've left what happened, what's, that, what's happening by a mental experience of what's not happening. You have to see how much you're relying on mind. Yeah. And to me, that's relying on self. That's how self defeats us, because we rely on self, and what's not happening becomes more important than what's happening. To the mental process, what's not happening is way more important than what's happening. Because the mental process can play with what's not happening. Anything can happen in what's not happening. And the mind is like a, 
It's not even that good, but it's like a jazz player that wants to improvise. Okay? So let's say you go, okay, here's the, here's the theme for the song tonight. What's not happening? Okay, <laughs> separation, my girlfriend did this, I'm going to get cancer, if my neighbor's going to win the, uh, you know, the lottery and not give me any money, everyone's out to get me, I'll never be in love again, I'll never have a kid, blah, 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 blah. and it just rips. And then you're in the little audience listening to these notes of the duress and anxiety, and you're hanging on every one of them. All the while, all the other gates are open. There's feeling, there's seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling, but there's no one attending to it. You're all up in the porno theater, all your <laughs> attention and interest, and you're watching Paul do Dallas, yeah? or Dallas basically doing Paul, usually. So you're up there, and all the other gates are wide open, but you're not attending to any of them. So you've been sucked up the ass of self, and you're in its little realm, which is what's not happening. Why? Because the self can appear to be happening, and what's not happening. The self is a thought, and it seems to be a self as through thinking, yes? Through interpreting. That's its huffing and puffing, making up a house that is going to blow, that, blow away, yeah? That's it. A thought begets another thought. In this case, the thought of being a self has seemingly risen up and now thinks it's having all the thoughts. Yeah? A feeling of being a self is now the one that has all the feelings. Yeah? The conscious contact is now claimed by the one who thinks it's seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, touching. Every time, and doesn't even do it anymore, it's a belief now. Well, every time seeing is happening and feeling is happening and hearing is happening, there's a belief that it's you that's conscious. You're seeing that. Yeah? You never really sense the verb of seeing. All you sense is the imaginary nouns of the seer and the seeing. But the seeing isn't really felt. Because if it, is, if it was, you would be traveling a lot lighter. That's a pretty good indicator you would be traveling a lot lighter in your day because your day would be very, very verb-like instead of noun-based. Yeah? And when you're a verb, it's very difficult to have a story and really believe it that life is happening to something because everything is happening. How could you say which is happening to which? Yes? Everything is a verb. Only when you make up a noun that all the verbing take gives, is given a direction. It's either happening to me now, or now something I want to happen to me isn't happening to me. And every, all the direction of all the verbs, which is all interpretive, is given by the idea of being a noun. Once you put that flag on the ball, that becomes the reference point. Yeah? And now the mind tries to make sense of this ball of verbing by saying, oh, it's happening to me, they're doing it to me, I did it to them, I wanted that to happen to me, it's not, it's happening to you, so I'm envious of that. And all on on. And all this mental experience occurs as soon as you take the form of a noun. And then, doing and having is seen as you're the doer and haver. And yet the greatest masters, some of the greatest masters, I would say, at least in my view, like Ramana Maharshi from India, his whole point that he beat every, every, every day, there is no personal doer. Buddha was supported, so purported to have said that all right, events are happening, deeds are being done, but there's no individual doer thereof. If you hear that, there's no individual doer thereof, if you're not the doer and haver of your life, then whose life is it anyway? And only by taking the role of being the doer and haver could you harvest such a crop of guilt and shame. So much importance given to what you committed or omitted. So much relevance given to movements that you had absolutely no say in the matter. Taking burdens and making burdens that are not yours. You're like at a baggage claim and you're claiming them all. <laughs> you're paying off the wazoo. All right, that bag, 30, yes, it, I'm, it's coming with me. $800 for all the bags you want to take. If, the, if, if there's the, the only branch doing and having, and I mean guilt and shame can rest on, is the sense of being the personal doer. All the, all the 
great pointers always bring you to that one situation. You're not the doer. That's the great relief here. When you put the burden down that this is your life, then you can live it as if it's happening. Not to you, but happening. You give up the sense of a noun, or like St. Francis said, what would be the noun in his view? It would say, he would say, in the self-forgetting. It's not self-forgotten, it's self-forgetting. It's an activity, it's a verb, yeah? What you are is a verb, and if you're sensing it, how you could translate it here would be, that is what self-forgetting looks like. Yes? You're living as the verb of what you are, and that, that translates here as self-forgetting. It's not self-forgotten. It's not one time only. It's a forgetting of it. Yeah? Every moment you're living in the forgetting of it. Why is it so difficult to live in the forgetting of it? My view is because you're identified as it. You're keenly interested. Your mind and the consciousness that's been captured by it is keenly interested in the idea of being a self because it believes it's it. Yeah? If you can entertain this not you, I'm telling you, you will lose interest in it, and that's the self-forgetting. You just lose interest in the verb of selfing, and that's the self-forgetting. Yeah? Where does that interest go? I don't know. But something is going to manage where it gets to and goes and gets delivered to, and it's not going to be self-centeredness. Yeah. Then the light, then the world can see anew to you. It can seem anew to you. It hasn't changed one bit, but the meaning you give it has changed. Yeah? The meaning, where all the meanings are being give, delivered from will change. You've had a giant piece of time of living under the meaning of self-centeredness. Then, when there's the self-forgetting, a new set of meaning is given to the same, same things you call life. Yeah? And of course, your dance is predicated on what you're dancing with. If you're dancing with, with a gorilla, you're going to stop the dance when it wants to stop. Yeah? If you're dancing like with a gazelle, it's beautiful. But there's going to be dancing going on. All there is is verbing going on. And it's not going on to you or by you because you're a verb. You are consciousness. You're the verb of consciousness, which here is conscious of. What it is. That's its activity here. All there is is consciousness. That's the stillness and the void and the emptiness, let's say. But here, in the appearance of a world, in being, in existing, its existence is portrayed in the verb of conscious of. Yeah? So I am conscious of a, wor a world. I'm conscious of the thoughts. I'm conscious of feelings. I'm conscious of possibilities that I don't see. I'm conscious of energy. I can feel the intimation of awareness. All of these are all brought about by the quality that you are, which is conscious. And that consciousness is conscious of here. It's verbing all day. <clears throat> but when you try to become conscious, what happens? You're inherently unconscious. No, no, I've got to keep going, right? Yeah. Yeah. When you try to become conscious, you're inherently unconscious to the fact that all there is is consciousness. It's really an optionless state. Like in a manipulated way, abstinence in AA is like that, in a sense. When you don't ever think, of, when abstinence, there's no, you don't, there's no option that's being entertained. Oh, I could drink, or I will down the road. Or it's just a done deal. The problem doesn't exist for you anymore. That's a damn good solution. This is what it's like. You realize that isn't so, and your interest and attention gets disengaged from that, and then that interest and attention, driven by being conscious, yes, or being that conscious, right, fulfills and maintains itself. In the living of it, yeah? Every day you're conscious. Every freaking day, every second, you're conscious. You're seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, and touching. But there's very, very little recognition of the verb of that. We keep saying it's a noun that's doing it, that I'm conscious. I, Paul, am conscious. It's like I'm doing consciousness. It's not, so... Consciousness is, at best, moving through this apparatus like a light would move through a set of prisms. And if you see the, if you look through the prism, that light and all the refractions will appear to be something. A world filled with objects, people who think they're individuals and separate and have lives and doing and having and all this. But it's all contracted and all presented and all projected by undifferentiated light, spirit. We're reading it differently because of the conditionality of the body. The body is dualistic. 
Yes? Male, female, yes, no, high, low, earth, heaven. All these opposites playing with each other. We don't see the unity of all things. It's just like here because it's always so that all there is is consciousness. You never feel it because it's always so. The only way your mind can recognize something is if it was here and it left and it comes back. You can't recognize what's always so because it's always so. If I put my hand on your shoulder when you were born and it hasn't moved since, you would not know you had a hand on your shoulder. Just like you don't know the effects of gravity. Did you talk about gravity today at a cafe? The effects of gravity? No. Yet it's, fo it's a force on your body 24-7. But you have no idea about it. You never experience it unless you leave it. And by its absence, then you know its presence. Yes? The same thing. You know the presence of consciousness by your absence as a self. Nothing has to change. Nothing is added. Nothing subtracted. It's just what is has seemingly been present, you, is recognized as absent, and that's the presence. That's why it says in self-forgetting. It doesn't say in self-getting. It says self-forgetting. It's not self-getting. I'm going to get some presence for me. How can an absence ever get a presence? It's a recognition that it's absent, that's the presence. Just like it's the recognition that all there is is light that darkness is only the absence of light. It doesn't have an inherent uh, characteristic of its own. It's just the absence of light. Yeah? So we're, in a sense, there can't be the absence of this light, but in the appearance, we appearing as this, as a present, causes the, the light to seem to be absent to us. And then you look for everywhere instead of recognizing how can you look for what's everywhere. You're looking from it every second. How could you be a special somewhere that's now looking for everywhere? It would mean that ain't everywhere if you could look for it. It would mean that there's a special reality of a special somewhere, and then there's a concept of everywhere that special somewhere is going to look for. That's playing God by a special somewhere, and it doesn't exist. All there is is everywhere. It's like pride. It doesn't take its... If it took a second, that it wouldn't be it. Because it's always so at all times, and that means it's of no time. If, ever, if something was always so at all time, that would mean it's no time. That would mean it's eternity. And eternity here looks like no time. So that pause that we manipulate, we try to in AA with serenity prayers and stuff like that. I was sharing with someone the other day. Can you imagine if you did have a map of your life? For the, since, since you've been alive and you had some control over it and the only boon you had was you could place a few pauses in your life so here you are maybe I have 56 years so alright I'm going to put a pause that night I decided to get out of my car and I got hit by that drunk driver I'm going to put a pause there in other words I'm going to sit there and think you know when I was there at this bar two hours ago there was only the bartender and waitress it's January 30th Freezing cold night in Baldwin, Long Island. I don't think a giant party broke out since I was last here an hour and a half ago. I think, wait a minute, I think I'll go home. Yeah? Now, maybe if, that, if you could do that, a 30-something year effect wouldn't have happened. I wouldn't have gotten run over by the car. Yeah? Or another pause here, another pause there. The pause is an eternal moment in time. Yeah? And you've been introduced to it now. Why not live from it? Why have it bookended by time and giving the relevance of time over it, but to see that that's it? Have you ever had one? There's definitely a, not a sense of time in a pause. It's sort of like an eternity could happen in it. You just Everything stops. All the selfing, all that engine of selfing and seeking and thinking and knowing and this and all this stuff stops. And you're open to what? A new possibility. Something you've never done before or tried. Yeah? It's like you finally know what to do when you don't know what to do. Ding! Yeah. That's what this is like. You have a pause from the mind's reaction to a situation and it's immediately its immediate take. You have a pause there and anything can happen in that pause. A freedom ensues. I've seen it in my own life. Things that I thought were never going to change that really harassed me in my personal life. Certain things where I would flip out and make a big ass of myself. 
in situations, usually, usually around holidays and significant others. It's incredible. I mean, it was like a, one of those blades that's uh, hovering over your head, you know, and made my mind try to control and think, I, I shouldn't do that because I know what's going to happen if I do do that. But, uh, and then, as one moment, one night it occurred again, the trigger occurred, and there it was, ready for, you know, destruction. But there was a pause. I didn't produce it. Something happened, a pause, and everything just stopped, almost like in freeze frame. And something like almost finally like a cloud lifted out of me and passed away. And I've never had that behavior since. Now I had all of this thinking about it was this is going to haunt me forever. I can't get over it. I can't therapize it. Nothing seems to work. I prayed over it. I surrendered it to my God. This and that. Nothing seems to have happened. But that one moment, it was preceded by a pause. And that pause was entertained. And then the same old, same old direction did not take. It went a different way. Every moment that possibility is available. But if you play God over it, you'll limit it. Yeah, that's the dilemma. Even when there's the appearance of quote-unquote God in your life, who, who claims it as an experience? Your God, self. The self says, oh, I had just had this incredible epiphany. It didn't have an epiphany. The epiphany was the absence of self. And you were conscious, so you were conscious of the absence of self. Yeah? You're not conscious as a self. You're conscious. So you can be conscious of the absence of self. And when you see the absence of self and, quote-unquote, you continue, you will finally get you're not that. Because that can disappear and you will still be verbing. You can have the complete absence of self and life goes on. You have a question now? Huh? I hope you um, forgot. No, I have a You were talking about consciousness, and um, I'm just coming back, you know, and I found that I was so conscious over my addiction that I don't want to get high because I felt everything was so conscious. So I guess now that I've been out there and just was unconscious in a way, That's right. now my fear is like that it's going to be too much. Because I, I, I find that I think about like how to manage my addiction all the time. Well, that's the thing with that consciousness. When the consciousness is is uh, been hijacked and captured by the mental process, it will drive you crazy. That's why you want to get loaded to be unconscious, because you're very self-conscious. Yeah, self-conscious. Your mind is representing the day from f with you as a star, and it drives you fucking crazy. And there doesn't seem to be any relief, so you get loaded again, so that you can become somewhat unconscious to that. But this is a solution that has nothing to do with a problem. It's realizing you're not what's capturing the spotlight of your attention. And when you entertain, I'm not that self, that I'm all that I'm like, thinking about. I may not be much, but it's all that I'm thinking about. That's exactly it. You're really nothing, and that's all that you're thinking about. <laughs> Making up a sense of being a something. It's like whipping up something, you know, like this, and you figure by if you keep doing this, that some real thing will appear. It will coagulate into something. Yeah? And that's what's driving you crazy. Your, your ability to be conscious is driving you crazy, taken over by the self. That's how insane it is. It plays God with the quality of God. Yeah. And it can't take the spotlight. That's what drives you crazy. That's why you want it. You want to be special. You want to be all there is, but you're not up to that. You're not up to being all there is. <laughs> you, can't handle, you can't handle that cape. You can't handle that burden. You cannot be all there is as a self. It just will flip it out. It goes neurotic, it flips out, and it needs relief. Yeah? And no matter how bad it was when you got out there, it will seem to be a damn good idea when you're laying in bed thinking about all the feelings you're having and, every, and all the thoughts that are driving me crazy. Well, that me is a thought. And you can see that because why? You're conscious. You're conscious prior to thinking. So the consciousness can see the thinking. The thinking is not making you conscious. The consciousness can see the thinking. We're believing, we believe the cart is the horse. We think the thinking is what's making us conscious. I'm conscious of something by thinking about it, yeah? But no, the consciousness is you're conscious of the thinking. And if you become conscious of thinking, you will see the idea of a self is a thought. 
It's wrapped with a feeling. That's why they call it a sense of self, but it's still a thought. And if you stop attending to it, and our, our humble little suggestion is, I found that all the attention and interest that's gluing you onto that screen of self is because you believe it's you. If you can entertain it's not you, I'm telling you, you will lose interest in it. Just like when someone starts yapping to me about their problems and all their thoughts, I have a great immunity to their thoughts. I have great wisdom. I can go, you know, you should not. You should get into a program, blah, 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 blah. But I may have the same exact thoughts, but they're held as being about me, and I will be very confused around them. It's not the thoughts. The thoughts are not bringing you meaning. You claiming the thoughts is yours injects meaning into them. Then you open them up as if they came from outside of you. So you can have, be sort of guilt-free. But in fact, your conditioning injects meaning into the thought with the word my in front of it. When you hold a thought to be yours, it truly is yours. It's all of you. All those old ideas, all those beliefs, all those hang-ups get injected into those thoughts. So a, a nice, innocent, five-word train of thought like, I'm not really doing much today. If you have a belief that you're lazy and something's really bad about being lazy, that th those five thoughts are going to drive you crazy. Yeah? Because you're going to feel really bad that you're not doing anything. Why? Because that means you're lazy. Why? What does that mean? That means you're no good. What does someone who's no good get? Nothing. What do they deserve? Nothing. A set heartache and pain, and then the shit hits the fan. <laughs> Playing God from beginning to end. No, no freedom from the loop. You play God, you suffer as God, you, you pray to a God, and that God causes you to feel guilt and shame. It's all you. All self. <laughs> there's a freedom, because there's something that's seeing all that God playing. Yes? And that's something, it's not a thing, it's a consciousness. I would say that's more you than the thought system that's playing God. Why? You can tell it by its fruits. What does it honor most? What's happening now? Does it honor the past and future? No. Yeah? Does it bow down to what's not happening and harvest the crops of what's not happening and bring them back into what's happening and experience them in physical and mental conditions all day? No. It has immunity to what's not happening. Why? Because it sees it, it's not happening. It's engrossed in what's happening because that's the verb of its own nature. Yeah. It captures your attention and interest as soon as it's, it's broken from the bondage to the idea of being a self. And what bonds you is because you cherish that idea. Because the mental process you identified as made it up. It loves it. The way it loves it, the way it massages it, the way it embraces it is thinking about it all fucking day. It doesn't have hands. It doesn't have an arms to embrace it. It embraces it by thinking about it, by sending its focused attention to it, by being incredibly interested in it. That's how it shows love. That's how it grooms its hair. That's how it caresses its skin. Yes? It adds flesh and bone to this idea of being a self by cherishing it. And that drive to be special and relevant is unbelievable. I was told, we were speaking to people last night, and you would rather not know the truth if that was caused by you than to be the truth. The mind. Seriously. The mind would rather not be the truth and appear to be totally lost here than to just give up and be that. If it, could do, if it could get it by doing, it may be interested in it. But once it's seen that there's nothing to do or have around it, it loses total interest in it. Because there's no relevance it can mine in being the truth. <laughs> there really isn't. It has to be special. It has to be coming in later, before the, after the meeting starts, and then having an entourage, and a little inner circle, and having a higher chair, maybe and having everyone meditate, and then leaving immediately, and no one can get up until they get that, make their getaway. So everyone stay for ten minutes while so-and-so leaves, and we'll have some announcements afterwards. So then they skip out the side door, and they drive away, and you're like, oh, we've been showered by the presence of our special someone. 
all the while denying that spec that what you are by making him or her so much that you're making you not that the mind 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 yeah. I think that's what flips people out like last night they're expecting someone to come in who's special so I'm hanging out before the talk starts and sitting there fucking around and then snap <laughs> and they're like what I think yeah, I was supposed to come out of a room you know when they ring a bell and then I come out and I sit down okay uh, and so they you know usually have a picture. <laughs> usually have a picture of some master, usually dead. You know? Then that you know, my my friend Deb had her kids there, so the, the, her daughter drew a picture of a a monkey and cut it out and then pasted on another picture of a, with, that said a zoo. It was a pretty nice piece of art for a little eight year old. Yeah. So I took that and I taped it as my lineage photo, the monkey <laughs> escaping from the zoo. So I say. <laughs> bow down, bow down, old great monkey one. All right. <laughs> I thought it was so perfect choreograph, wasn't it? It was a beautiful piece of art, and I just okay. I found some tape in the kitchen and put it up because they had the flower, and we put it on the vase, and there was the monkey at the zoo. <laughs> There's your saint. There's the bringer of the message. What? Yeah. <laughs> Give me a banana. Farting and doing this. That's it, monkey. That's not special. I don't want to have any interest in this. Usually they say, we die to drive you somewhere. I'm like asking people for rides. <laughs> hey, I'm not going to give him a ride. He's not special. Fuck you. I thought it was a special guy that was going to give him a ride. That's funny, eh? So, yeah. It's a simple invitation. We're going to beat it into the ground every week. Three times a week. We're going to have repetition of it. Yeah? And so your head's going to come out of one lace of the straight jacket and then the other. And then it's just going to stand up in its own size instead of the contrived size of self-centeredness. Yeah? It'll open up and you'll start entertaining. Just like an A says, you will, instead of trying to fit circumstances around you which makes a very small world and makes you as a self seem really big that's what mostly self's doing you will fit yourself around circumstances which will make you huge yeah you have the potential you can play it small or big but there's no one playing it small or big yeah there's just playing small or big actually it doesn't even matter if you play small or big because there's a seeing in both the seeing of both you know the seeing is what you are, not the, not the expression, the bigness or the smallness. It's the seeing that's so to me. So, I'm going to pass the basket. Yes. That's a nice slap. Patrick. <laughs> yeah, we had a long... I'm going to be doing a... Oh, man. We go to this symposium. Then I'm going to go to this symposium in Fordham. These guys, these uh, psychiatrists are... Uh, presenting at the seminar uh, non-duality as an addictive therapy for oh, addiction. Boy. So I'm going there. It's going to be funny. Suppose if you go to the symposium. I should bring that monkey picture. I have it. <laughs> That'd be good. Eh? Don't worry, you are. <laughs> hey, thank you, everyone. This is going to get me my subway tokens. Well, I'm in the, the big apple. So we'll end with the serenity prayer. Eh? Mm -hmm.
really right. didn't no, understand it. Right. Right. What he was so it wasn't yeah. Yeah. No, not at all. Yeah. These, were, these people were very sincere, right. sincere right. spiritual seekers, meditators, whatever. But they weren't. They were coming from a place of, I admit, they didn't I, pay I, price. I, don't, I don't. It doesn't work. One of the wonderful no. things on the other side of the opposites of no. hell and suffering. I don't have any. I don't think I have any. In themselves, and I was a Zen monk for ten I mean, years. And in the temple are many people who are living in a delusion in a spiritual way and working really hard to be compassionate and to be good. And all of that is nonsense. Someone who has the absence of suffering and has, li- has had the burden lifted, done, finished, the, j- the light is in. The job is over. What's funny about last night is like uh, there's this point where there were these children in there, and they were like just being kids, yeah. and they were you know had these snacks and snacks and bags, the bags making all this noise, and they crunch here. And those people like, we're going to get this bag. And I'm like, wow, well, I'll be, I'll give them some time. I used to give talks, and the kids would be doing that. I go, hey, you, stop acting like a kid. Hey, wait a minute. Are you a kid? Oh, you are a kid. Okay, continue. Right, or, like, or actually, like, should we be more like them? And yeah. Then, and then the, the, all these dogs started barking outside. It was kind of the same thing. It was sort of like, oh, shut the fucking dogs up. And I'm like, oh, no, this is kind of what it's all like, about. The dog have food in nature. <laughs> and they're like, gone for? I don't know, but it's a good um, question. Yeah, I mean, it's very moment. Yeah. Well, there's three Wednesdays. Three Wednesdays. Yeah, yeah. Two, two and two Mondays. Two Mondays. I'll be back on the 14th. So you get t shirts right. with World to World right. Cities on the back. I'm starting with the Yapping Tour of uh, 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 2010. <laughs> no, yeah. Get the monkey. Oh, yeah. Get the kid. Get the kid. The monkey lineage. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. the monkey yeah. Yapping. Get the kid's uh, drawing and make that your shirt. I yeah. 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 Uh, Wednesday. You better be careful, they'll think you're Hunnaman. I'll read this one again. Yeah, Thank that's you. right. That's for on the... That's yeah, that's the emissary. Yeah. Hopefully I can live up to what I think it means. <laughs> I gotta go. You, I, you know what I...